Welcome to the American Maritime Podcast. We are glad you're here. I'm your host, Mike Roberts, president of the American Maritime Partnership. We have a very special guest joining us today, if I may, a longtime friend, Congressman Rick Larson. Congressman Larson represents the 2nd District located in Northwest Washington State. Uh, he serves as a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee and the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, including uh, the Maritime and Coast Guard Subcommittee of the TNI Committee. He is currently the chairman of the Aviation Subcommittee, and, and Congressman Larson was first elected to Congress in 2000, and I think that's about the time we first met. Uh, Congressman Larson, welcome. We are honored to have you with us, and thank you for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for the uh, invitation. I appreciate it. I'm out here in the Pacific Northwest uh, in Everett, Washington, and uh, um, very apropos for this podcast, uh, we have a view of Possession Sound and the Port of Everett and watching uh, sh big ships come and go every once in a while, and uh, including Navy ships. So really, really glad to be on the podcast today. Thanks. Great. That's a great a great fit for for the podcast and for your <laughs> your mission uh, in Congress. It's been it's been a, a great twenty years now, uh, and and all of it I think uh, involved with the, the maritime industry in some fashion. So let me just dive in now. We're going to start with a discussion on national security issues. Mm -hmm. um, a, as a member of Armed Services Committee, what do you see as some of the biggest national security challenges facing our nation? Yeah, I might surprise uh, your listeners a little, uh, listeners and watchers a little bit on this one because um, um, I think that one of the biggest challenges in the Pentagon today is how to incorporate uh, disruptive technologies into the operations of the Pentagon and to the operation of your day-to-day uh, -day warfighter. When I'm talking um, disruptive technologies, the incorporation of using 5G technologies for communications, the role that artificial intelligence and machine learning plays in decision-making uh, in the Pentagon, the role that quantum computing will play for modeling and testing um, you know, the, the, the next generation weaponry, uh, the next generation platforms. Those are important because of our peer competitors like China are catching up and in some respects ahead on some areas. And so we need to think about how these technologies are going to support the uh, national security missions of the uh, security agencies uh, in the US government. It's an area where the US has traditionally had an advantage in terms of techno technological uh, advancement. Uh, and, and it sounds like what we're saying is, what you're saying is we need to maintain that lead and the, and the next frontier, so to speak, is uh, AI and machine learning. Yeah, but I think what's also interesting is in the past, a lot of this work and research and development has been sort of uh, nested in the government. But uh, the commercial enterprise, uh, commercial sector is where a lot of this R&D uh, takes place. And it, it's going to have implications. It's going to have implications for your industry, um, whether it's on your, pri uh, your commercial or defense side. How we build the how we build the next generation of ships, how it's designed, uh, how many crew um, are on that ship. Uh, these are questions that will be um, influenced by how we employ these technologies in order, to, and not for their own sake, but in order to stay competitive and in order to stay ahead of the competition. Speaking of the competition, and you mentioned uh, China earlier, uh, we've had a lot of discussion on this podcast about uh, China's maritime strat strategy. We've, we've really been yeah. focused on that. Uh, China's government has made massive investments in shipbuilding and in the maritime infrastructure and shipping over the past decades, uh, decade or more. What are your thoughts generally about uh, China-U.S. relations? And, and if you want to comment a little bit on the maritime side of uh, of this of the ledger, I, that would be of interest certainly. Yeah, well, backing up on the on the uh, the general comments, uh, backing up to the general comments, I think what you see in the Biden administration is a little bit different approach than the previous administration. I think it's still as tough, but w the Biden folks have said they want to take a more multilateral approach in in both in the competition side as well as where we need to cooperate with China. And, and we're starting to see that. We saw our Secretary of State and National Security Advisor in Anchorage uh, 
very forcefully um, confront China on human rights issues and issues of technology um, and cheating on, on trade. Uh, but also we've seen Secretary Kerry there uh, in Beijing to meet to talk to the Chinese about climate, the Chinese government about climate change. So it's gonna be a, a cooperation and competition approach, I think that's been that we'll take, see over the next several years and more working with our partners and allies uh, in the region as well. And with regards to maritime strategy, probably the most prominent uh, issue facing the US and friends and allies in the region has to do with the South China Sea and how, how China, um, the Chinese government sees uh, the South China Sea relative to how the Philippines and Vietnam and other, other regional players see it. Uh, there's a lot of competing claims there, um, competing claims that are ripe for uh, conflict if they aren't adjudicated or uh, managed well. And the US for its part uh, needs to be uh, strong and with its for, uh, freedom of navigation operations to basically make our claim that these are international waters and, and not owned by any one country. So there's having the capability to do that is both a surface capability and it's a space capability to watch what's going on. It's an undersea capability as well that will continue to call for investment uh, in the um, in our capabilities and assets, not just through the Pentagon, but the U.S. Coast Guard is helping out there, and there may be other agencies that have interests as well. Yeah, I know. No, excuse me. I know you have a, a naval base in your district. Um, uh, can you discuss the importance of uh, readiness and ensuring a commercial maritime uh, base to support our military? Yeah, this is really critical in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, um, I have a great opportunity here in Everett to look out my window and see Naval Station Everett uh, every day and see destroyers come and go. We are a carrier capable base as well. Uh, we, can host, we can host a carrier. Uh, we're expecting the Navy to announce their um, strategic laydown um, for the next year uh, very soon. And uh, we anticipate that that will uh, continue the Navy's commitment to look at Naval Station Everett as a, a place where we can put more destroyers. Uh, now to do that, um, we need to have a commercial uh, sector that supports uh, maintenance of, of, the, of the platforms of the ships. And we have uh, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard in the uh, other side of the Puget Sound that supports the nuclear capabilities. And we have a, a huge private sector uh, uh, to support uh, maintenance of other of uh, other platforms, so you know the more ships that show up here as home port as home ported here, the better it is for the commercial sector um, and the, and the the U.S. based uh, maintenance uh, folks, um, as well as uh, you know it, 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 one ship begets another. You know, Navy ships beget commercial ships. Uh, um, we have a huge uh, shipbuilding sector and a boat building sector in the Pacific Northwest, all supportive of uh, uh, things like uh, MSP and the Jones Act. Uh, and we need to continue to support those efforts um, in Congress as well to support a, a US-based commercial um, maintenance um, and shipbuilding sector. Certainly the, uh, the shipbuilding, uh, the, the maritime sector generally in, in, in Everett is, uh, is critical and well known throughout the country, uh, even in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, it's a great uh, it, it, it's just a great um, in infrastructure up there, um, and, and its proximity to the Pacific Theater makes it uh, e extra important to, to support uh, uh, in 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 that region. Um, let's talk a little bit about shifting a little bit toward uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's something I know it's very important to your work in Congress uh, yeah. and on the TNI committee. How are things going with the, the uh, infrastructure le legislation? What are some of your top priorities? Yeah, I guess to, to think about it, uh, the infrastructure, um, how it's going, the president proposed the American Jobs Plan, uh, but on the committee, we also just first have to get the um, surface authorization bill done. That is the programs that help fund the roads, bridges, highways, transit programs that we have. And so two things are going on. Uh, on the committee right now. One is just the regular work of getting the regular programs reauthorized. And then we have to marry that with what the, the 
Biden administration has talked about with the American Jobs Plan, the infrastructure side of the investment. So um, we're going to move forward probably this month on this, what we call the surface bill, the roads, bridges, highways, transit, uh, while we continue to work within the House of Representatives on the larger infrastructure uh, plan. I th do think that you know when it comes to my priorities, certainly I have, I have surface, um, not, not water surface, but surface uh, roads, bridges, highways, bridge safety is critical. We've got transit agencies who are shifting to all electric fleets. Um, that is coming and it is uh, important that we do that to pull carbon, uh, em carbon emissions out of the transportation sector. I'm on the aviation subcommittee, in fact, I'm the chair. So we're looking at how we can green up uh, air travel and airport operations as well. But an important part of all this is uh, what we call in, in, the, in Washington state, the maritime blue sector, that is this, this commercial maritime sector and uh, how it can both contribute to pulling carbon emissions um, uh, out, of the, um, out of the air, but also what we need, need to do to support that. Our ferry system is the largest in the country. Here's this is an example. Our ferry system is the largest in the country measured by people and vehicles moved. And our state wants to um, both move to hybrid as well as electrified uh, ferries. And we can do that, but we need to make investments in shoreside infrastructure, uh, in pure space, as well as the um, building a new generation of ferries themselves, which is gonna be great business uh, here in the Northwest for, uh, for the shipyards. Uh, I think the emphasis on sustainability is certainly a new uh, uh, or an evolving area for, for our sector, um, although many, have many companies and many individuals have been working at it for a long time. Uh, it sounds like this infrastructure bill will really emphasize that, particularly on the maritime side of things. I'm, I'm aware of uh, electric-powered tugboat, for example, um, and, and just uh, the, the opportunity for research and development there, I think, is very exciting. And, and, and that will be fun so there will be funding for that in the bill, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah, there will be. And, and it's all, you know, I, I, I had this uh, briefing this week uh, with aviation, and this, this is relevant, but... The, on sustainable aviation fuels and sort of, but the broader message of that briefing is that it's not just about what the propulsion is. Um, it, it could be about the materials we use to make platforms so that like your, your next tug is made of materials that are lighter, but just as strong. So you're pulling weight out, but you're still maintaining power. Uh, this gets into physics that are well beyond my knowledge as a member of Congress. But it's not just a matter of doing one thing. It can be a matter of doing several things in order to both uh, increase the power, uh, decrease weight. Um, so you get in the same, same force to be able to do the job. Because, you, you know, like for tugs, you want to be sure the, 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 um, the propulsion system on that tug keeps that big ship where it's supposed to be. Um, that safety has to be foremost as we move forward on it but we've got the chance to invest in the R&D now to look at other ways to keep the safety and to do things in a more sustainable way as well. We didn't have that 15 years ago. We have it now. And we should, uh, we should be thinking about that investment. It, speaking of investments, and I'll, I'll take you back to the, the China story briefly uh, on this. Uh, there's a study out uh, by the CSIS, which you may have seen, uh, which estimates on a conservative basis that the Chinese government is uh, uh, supporting the uh, commercial Chinese shipping and shipbuilding industry to the tune of roughly $15 billion uh, per year. Uh, and that's a conservative estimate, uh, according to uh, the authors of the report. Um, we're not spending that kind of money in the United States on the American commercial uh, shipping and shipbuilding industry. In fact, it's a very small fraction of that. Um, what do you think it would take to get us, and this is both with your armed services hat on and your TNI hat on, uh, to get us to a spending level that uh, might begin to make us competitive with China in this area? Yeah, I'm glad you're saying, uh, get, you're not saying gets us to $15 billion a year. The, 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 the fundamental difference is our, we have two very different models of governance. Um, right. The Chinese government will spend as a government uh, in order to succeed and co-op private sector. Um, uh, so they have state-owned enterprises whose single single job is to do that, and we're not going to do that in the United States. 
Um, it's not our model um, and we're not gonna, we just can't shift to that. We couldn't afford to do that, but with our with government money, but there are things we can do to, to support the foundations of that. And we need to do a little bit better job on that. But I mentioned, you know, the MSP, there's the, um, the Jones Act, uh, some just some fundamental parts of the uh, support infrastructure for the shipbuilding industry. And we need not to undermine those fundamental supports as well. Don't undermine the Jones Act, as a for instance, uh, as a you know. It, let's let's start there and not have that debate anymore, um, right. because you know, just as a for instance. But there, are, but you know, through the defense bill to, and through the transportation bill, there will be ways that we can support uh, support maritime. But we'll have to do that in you know with your input, your 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 industry's input so that we get it right for the things that we do do, that it gets it done right and that we don't go backwards. Great. Well, you mentioned the Jones Act and, I, and I, as, a, as the uh, president of the American Maritime Partnership, I have to thank you for your longstanding support for the Jones Act. It is critical um, and uh, uh, I, I, you, you, it, it comes up from time to time. Uh, but uh, do you have any sense that there's a, uh, a particular issue we need to be concerned about? I don't think so. I, I just think that being ever vigilant um, is important because, as we as we've seen with natural disasters and with the pandemic and other things, you just never know what's going to come up. And um, I think that it's important that you you your members take some time to educate newer members of Congress on the importance of the Jones Act. Uh, I can tell you, and it's not just because my staff. Uh, put this in my notes that are sitting in front of me and that's exactly why I can tell you, but 2,240 jobs in my district are directly related to the Jones Act. Um, $130 million in labor income, uh, $642 million in economic activity, just in my district, Yeah. right? Just in the second district. That's real money, those are real jobs, those are real people going and shopping at the local stores, going to the restaurants when they open, going to the movie theaters when they reopen, you know, it, it, the Jones Act is a, is a critical contributor to the economic vitality of the people I represent. And so I think having those numbers, having your members talk to new members of Congress to outline that for them, uh, it helps alleviate problems later on. Well, w I thank you for your time and your uh, willingness to join us here today. Any final thoughts from your side? Well, you know, it, it's uh, it's kind of a broken record these days, but i still just emphasize that people get your vaccines, wear your masks, practice social distancing. And for your members, uh, you know, not just the, the owners of the uh, shipping lines or of the, of the companies, but, but the, the workers, the people who work on the, on the boats, the people who are building the boats. Uh, this last year, I know has been really difficult for all of you. You've had to make a lot of changes to deal with COVID-19. You've had to protect your workers. Um, you've had, you know, workers living on ships for months at a time as well. I know it's been very difficult for folks and I, I'll just say thank you for your industries and your and the workers in your industry's contribution to keeping things moving for the United States. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel, I think is no longer an oncoming uh, uh, locomotive right. engine. Right. I think the light is progress um, through, the COVID, through COVID-19, but we're not there yet. And I just had to ask for a continued vigilance on that. Great. Well, Congressman Larson, thank you so much for being with us today. It has been so nice to hear about your work, important work in Congress. You've been an you have an open invitation on this show, so please do come back in the future. Uh, that is all for this episode of the American Maritime Podcast. Thank you for tuning in. I'm Mike Roberts, signing off. <laughs>